All right. And we are live. Please, everyone in the comments section, let me know if you can hear and see us okay. And welcome to this live stream, to those of you who are watching live, and welcome to those of you who are catching the replay as well. I'm here with Dr. Shadi Nasser. I have no doubt that our esteemed guest will draw viewers from all different uh, backgrounds. So I encourage all of you to sit back and relax and enjoy what will no doubt be uh, an absolutely fascinating interview. Um, I do hear a little bit of uh, echo, Dr. Nasser. I think that's from YouTube. Um, that might be, yeah. Do you want me to use the uh, headphones? Uh, yes, I, I do hear a little bit of a lag. I think it might just be like if you're streaming YouTube, uh, it might be there. So, uh, sorry, I was opening the oh. other one. Okay, sorry. okay. That, that's great. Yeah. Oh, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Nasser did his dissertation at Harvard University in 2011, where he earned a PhD in Arabic literature and Islamic studies. He's the author, of course, of several journal articles that have appeared in peer-reviewed journals like the Journal of Arabic Literature and Journal of Quranic Studies. He's also the author of the 2012 monograph, which shares the title with this dissertation, and that is the transmission of the variant readings of the Quran, the problem of Tawatr, and the emergence of Shawath. He's also the author of the upcoming monograph, currently scheduled to be released on the 22nd of October, and that's called The Second Canonization of the Quran, and the subtitle is Ibn Mujahid and the Founding of the Seven Readings. He's also the Associate Professor of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. And in all of his spare time, he's also doing some fascinating work with early Islamic poetry and how that influences our understanding of the Quran. Dr. Nasser, it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for uh, writing to me and inviting me to your show. Um, so um, I'm glad to be here to answer any questions, talk about variant reading the Quran. Uh, so um, it's a pleasure. So my name, as you said correctly, Shadi, and a variant reading is Shady, as uh, my uh, friends call me here. So both both are uh, standard, I would say. Yeah, I, I like your sense of humor. Excellent. Yeah. So we have a big complex topic today, but you thankfully have a system for organizing this. You've observed roughly five stages or five canonizations throughout this process. So can you just start us off with a big picture view of what this process is um, and summarize it for us so that we can know what we're talking about? Um, okay, so I'm calling um, these different stages of canonization of the Quran where um, we notice that at different times in history, we do have certain um, readings uh, in the Quran that they were excluded from, you know, what we call now the canon, okay? Um, so uh, we call basically the first stage canonization or codification is what everyone is familiar with, the Osmanic Codex. And this is the first canonization process where uh, the uh, readings or the codices of the companions of Muhammad, uh, they were excluded based on the Codex of, uh, of Osman. So that's, you know, what we call the first, or what I'm calling the first canonization. And then from the period of Osman, uh, let's say 200 years afterwards, we have a robust um, activity by the grammarians and exegetes to concentrate on this Osmanic Codex. Um, so even though Osman's attempt to limit the variants of the Quran to one Codex, um, variant readings kept multiplying. And this is evident uh, from the early works of grammar and exegesis that we have, that you have uncontrollable amount of variants that Muslims were using and circulating among themselves. Uh, so the second canonization, which is, you know, the, the study that I did in the previous, in the past four or five years, uh, is what Ibn Mujahid did out of a corpus of, I don't want to say unlimited, but many, many uh, readings that existed back then, probably as many as 50, uh, as sources tell us. Um, he uh, chose seven readings. And, you know, if we have time, we can talk about the criteria later on. But he chose out of those different um, eponymous or system readings, uh, seven. Um, 
So many scholars during the time of Ibn Mujahid and after him, they were not happy with the choice of the seven. Uh, so why did you choose only seven out of so many? These readings are also good. This reading is as good as the one you chose. Um, and people or scholars, they kept writing manuals of what we call qira'at or variant readings on more than seven or even less than seven, five, six, eight, nine, etc. Um, so, and also in Ibn Mujahid's system, when he chose the seven readings, each reading was not unique. So you can see also there are differences within one reading. So when we talk about, let's say, Asim or Nafa or, you know, these eponymous readers, they, Ibn Mujahid did not document only one variation. So there were many students of these uh, eponymous readers and there were also variations. So what happened is that you would have, let's say, a reading of Nafa or Asim and then you would have different students who were transmitting different things. And let's say 100, around 150 years later on, um, in, in North Africa and Muslim Spain back then, uh, so we have Abu Amr al-Dani and Shatabi, both of them, they were scholars of Qiraat, and they were mainly responsible for limiting those different variations or different students and limiting them into two only. So this is what, you know, we call the two Rawi canon, where each eponymous reader uh, started to have only two readers, two transmitters per reader. So this is a third canonization process where people from that stage onward they started to become more familiar with only two variations or two varieties uh, per one eponymous reading. Um, so between, let's say the, this is, sorry, I work with the Islamic calendar. So I just, my OSX, I need to convert, you know, so fourth, fifth century. So that's about around, you know, the 11th century. Um, uh, so this process of third canonization and then Three, four hundred years later, Ibn al-Jazari in the ninth century, Hijri, um, Islamic calendar, so that would be around the 1400s, uh, he came and added three more readings to those seven by Ibn Mujahid. And again, the same, you know, over, you know, for, for hundreds of years, uh, people were not happy by just having seven. They were also um, uh, reading and transmitting. Uh, other uh, system readings, and then Ibn al-Jazari came and then added those three readings, which already existed. So for hundreds of years, people were using those readings, but he did it, you know, forcefully in a sense. And he was, um, let's say, the uh, uh, one of the most accomplished scholars of Qiraat during that day. So that's the fourth period where really the system of 10 readings or 10 canonical readings, what we call them, uh, was fixed by the time of Ibn Jazir. And then what I call the fifth canonization, uh, it's the 1923-1924 Cairo edition of the of the Quran based on Hassan Asim. And I call it a canonization because, you know, during, you know, from that time onward, um, most Muslims became familiar with that variety, mainly due to the publication, you know, of that codex or that, you know, Mus'haf in Cairo. Um, even though we have, of course, other uh, editions from other readers, but most people are familiar still, even until today, familiar with that with that uh, variety. So this is a a, um, a general overview of those five stages, and there are, of course, you know, intermediate intermediary stages between these. But you know, I consider them to be really important junctures where things were excluded and things were uh, considered to be irregular, you know, by the Muslim community uh, in favor of what we are calling now, um, you know, canonical or in Arabic mutawatira or um, massively transmitted um, readings. So that's that's a general overview of the, uh, of the five stages. Excellent. So your first monograph, your 2012 monograph, the transmission of the very readings of the Quran, the problem of Tawatir and the emergence of Shawat. Can you explain to us is it, is it fair to say that you deal primarily with the second and third stage in detail in that monograph? Or is that, is that a fair assessment? Correct. So, so mainly in the first monograph, I, I dealt um, with the, um, it's not just specifically the second and the third stage, but uh, the whole concept of qiraat or variant readings and the whole concept of, of, of tawatr which is, uh, for those you know who do not know, it's a concept um, that means uh, there's a um, something which is widely transmitted by people to the extent that it is impossible 
for this group of people to lie or to fabricate uh, something about its transmission. So it's a self-evident truth. Uh, that's what we call Tawatur. Um, and you know the problem that um, uh, that I try to uh, tackle is um, you know how do we how how do we understand this concept of tawatur vis-a-vis qiraat or variant readings uh, when uh, many accounts from the classical sources do not agree with this concept of tawatur this this massively transmitted and it's a self-evident transmission of of variant readings variant readings qiraat and quran are two different things so when we talk about the quran we're talking about you know the um uh, the concept of Quran, forget about the variant readings. Variant readings is how to access this Quran or how to read it. Uh, in the early period, Muslims did not talk about this concept of Tawatur, massive transmission. And it's very evident that, you know, the variant readings were local. So people in Damascus were transmitting things different, you know, from people of Kufa or people from Mecca and Medina. And the reading or the variant reading was a um, a, um, a local thing rather than widely transmitted um, uh, system that every single Muslim or even every single scholar knew of. So, so yes, I was focusing on this second, let's say the second stage or before the second stage and afterwards a little bit to try to understand the, the mechanism um, by which Ibn Mujahid chose his system and how did uh, Muslim scholars react to his uh, system and when you know, this system crystallized um, and when did Muslims start to basically adopt it as you know part of their uh, of their recitation? Um, so yeah, very interesting. And the very readings are extremely important. I mean, you you've said that um, this is how you access the Quran. Is that is that correct? Correct. If you don't have variant reading, you have you can't read the Quran. That's it's as simple as this. So okay. you don't have the system of variant readings are you know what a masoretic text you know for those who, who know hebrew it's just you need the vowels and you need diacritics in order to read it uh there's a you know you can't read the quran using your own opinion and that's you know in the islamic tradition you have to rely on how your you know master taught it and how his master taught it uh, so you can't just you know do textual criticism you, you, you can of course but you may not within the tradition uh, so there's a difference between someone who is, um, you know, who has a manuscript and say, okay, I'm going to do textual criticism. I'm going to read the Quran on my own. And some scholar did that, you know, back back in the days. Uh, but of course, you know, they were uh, reprimanded. Uh, so uh, so if you don't have variant readings, the whole system with its principles and individual variations, you can't read the Quran. So this is why they are, you know, intertwined and very very important. You know, these these two. Together. Yeah, and, and we know primarily of the variant readings in modern printed Qurans. Mm -hmm. uh, but at some point, these were transmitted strictly orally, correct? So when uh, were these readings, uh, when did they begin to be documented? Um, so this is, um, uh, this is a little bit problematic, problematic from the sense of documentation. We don't have enough documentation from the early period. And we don't know how much writing and orality were intertwined back then. And I'm talking here, eighth century. Okay, um, so according to you know the tradition, yes, the Quran was orally transmitted. It was memorized by uh, by people. However, um, there was a time when the Quran was codified during the time of Uthman, when orality lost to written transmission. And what I mean by that is that Muslim scholars all agreed that regardless of your memory, regardless of how you memorize the Quran, you cannot deviate from the Uthmanic Codex. So even though certain readers, they were sure of how they memorize the Quran uh, through other channels, and, you know, they were saying that I have a good chain of transmission, you know, I studied with you know, X and, you know, Y and Z, you know, people, Muslim scholars post-Othmanic post period, they didn't care. As long as you are deviating from the text, we are not going to accept your reading, right? So in a sense, orality was attached to written transmission. So when someone tells you, well, the Quran was already transmitted regardless of the Rasim, regardless of, of the Othmanic um, 
uh, continental tax. That's not accurate because as long as you are deviating from the text, your reading will not be accepted. So there is a kind of um, uh, you know recipro reciprocal relationship between the written and the oral. There is no such thing as post Othman post Othmanic codification. There is no such thing as only oral transmission. You have to oral transmission based on the text. If you deviate from the text, you're regardless, no matter how good of a reader you are, no matter how fantastic your memory is, even if you deviate, you know, by one letter from the consonantal text, one of the consonantal texts, the five or six they had back then, your transmission will not be accepted. This, I think, touches on a question I have about uh, Shawath, which if, if you want to nuance the definition for the viewers, then, then fine, but for now, just non-canonical. Uh, non-canonical readings. Um, there are some Shawath readings that are transmitted from the time of Muhammad and the companions, aren't there? So this this is a question I, I had when I was reading your book. Ibn Mujahid and, and Al-Tabari, it seems like they would have established their criteria so that they could have selected or canonized some of those readings, mm -hmm. but their focus was more on Razum and, and popularity, um, you know, consensus. And is there a way they could have structured their criteria to canonize some of those readings that went back to Muhammad and the companions? Um, yes, that's, I mean, it's a very interesting question in the sense that you know the status the status of shawaz um you know there are different categories of shawaz or, or irregular or anomalous readings okay so uh, the the problem for let's talk about the easy category the easy category is that you also have shawaz or irregular readings transmitted on behalf of the canonical readers imagine for example you know i have a chapter in my coming book it's called the non canonical reading readings of the canonical readers Right, so okay. there are even transmissions on behalf of the canonical readers, which were also classified as shawath, as irregular, not accepted. So this easy category is that these regular readings, even though they agree with the Osmanic Codex, okay, uh, they don't have a, uh, they don't, they don't enjoy the consensus, let's say, of the readers, and they don't have a sound chain of transmission. Let's put it simply. It's more complicated than that, but just let's simply let's say uh, they were not agreed upon by the community of the of the Qurra or the readers. Okay. Now, the other complicated category of shawad is tho those which deviated from the codification of Uthman, the, co the, mus the Mus'haf. I mean, there are also readings attributed to the Prophet himself. You know, we have a category in, in Qira'at, it's called the readings of the Prophet, okay? And there are, uh, you know, three or four books even written on that in, in Arabic. Um, even though we do have accounts that go back to the prophet saying that he read this word as such, this word was also categorized as irregular or shawaf. They It's just like they didn't care. As long as the readings deviate from the Othmanic Codex, we will consider them to be irregular or shawaf. Even though we know that the prophet might have read as such, and we, might, when we also know that the other companions might have read as such. However, the Codex of Uthman abrogated all other codices, abrogated all other readings, and we are going to stick with that. So, yeah, and that is that is what I had such a, from, from the modern perspective, I'm thinking, why wouldn't Ibn Mujahid um, structure his criteria to accommodate those readings, but this is this is a modern perspective. So obviously, I'm 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 missing something, but it's it's a very yeah. interesting. Yeah, because to because the thing is, Ibn Mujahid, it's he came around 300 years after Uthman, right? So we are talking about three centuries okay. of Muslims only sticking to you know to the Uthmanic Codex. But actually, that was not the case. We have, we also have, you know, information from Iraq, from Kufa, that people kept reading according to the codices, let's say, of, of Ibn Mas'ud, even, you know, 150 years after Uthman. So, um, so yes, there were pockets in certain areas in the Islamic uh, world, especially in Iraq. Mm -hmm. There were different, you know, many things happening in Iraq um, back then. So it's, it's uncontrollable in a sense. 
but we do have accounts that people were still reading according to the Codex of Ibn Mas'ud, which is different from the Codex of, of Uthman. So Ibn Mujahid, you know, as someone appointed by, you know, the state, you know, as the, uh, you know, uh, chief reader, you know, Baghdad back then, uh, you you have to agree, you have to confine yourself to the rest. And that's something that Muslims, um, you know, for at least two centuries agreed that we are going to stick to the Uthmanic Rasm and we can't accept anything uh, um, uh, that deviated or that deviate from the uh, from the from the Uthmanic Codex. Okay, yeah. Ibn, uh, Ibn Masud's reading is interesting. I get the impression that people love it or hate it. There's some seems like some friction there with uh, Uthman uh, Bakalani argued for Ibn Masud's reading. Right there are right. some harsh words put on the lips of Al Hajjaj about Ibn Masud's reading, right. but they're using it in Kufa until the eighth century, and so it seems like people loved it or hated it. I mean, Ibn Masud is very interesting because uh, we, we, you know, as also many people pointed out, you know, we have so many accounts about his rejection and his um, uh, opposition, right, to. Uh, uh, to the committee that Osman formed. And he was saying, you know, I'm one of those uh, senior companions uh, of the Prophet. Um, he was criticizing Zaid bin Thabit, the head of the committee. You know, you were a little kid playing with the, with the, with the other kids and, you know, your forelock was dangling, you know, from your, from your head while I was taking the Quran fresh from the, from the mouth of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we always have to remember uh, very reading system readings or eponymous readings are very very attached to geography even until today even until today if you talk to people you know in morocco they are very proud of their Warsh reading so they are very very you know conservative about the Warsh. you have people in africa they're very conservative about abu amr ibn al-ala you know people are attached locally to their reading and this was the case also back then people in kufa they were you know groupies in a sense towards the group of ibn masoud and they, they did not want to uh, abandon the reading of Ibn Mas'ud for political reasons, you know, there's a lot of politics happening uh, back then. And we do have, actually, there is an interesting account transmitted in the history of, uh, of Ibn Khaldun, not his uh, Muqaddimah, it's the history, uh, which you don't find in other, um, in other accounts. There's, um, uh, you know, some kind of tension between um, Zaid bin Thabit and Ibn Mas'ud and actually, sorry, Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn al-Arabi, not, not, not Ibn Khaldun, the, uh, the jurist. He said that people claimed that uh, Uthman and, you know, sent someone to beat Ibn Mas'ud. It even reached, you know, the, uh, the stage of beating him and breaking, you know, some of his rib bones because of his opposition to, uh, you know, to the Codex of Uthman. Um, that's, you know, a weak uh, account, but... Uh, these things are transmitted. So it's, it's exactly as you said, people were, you know, for Ibn Mas'ud, you know, for his, uh, for his Mus'haf, and there were other people who uh, completely opposed it. He deviated from the consensus of the, uh, uh, of the Jama'ah or the group, and this is why they, they hated it. Um, despite that, it's still the reading of Ibn Mas'ud continued uh, for, you know, at least 150 years in Kufa. And even in, in Hanafi fiqh, you know, you would have many instances where uh, the Hanafi jurists would actually use citations from the Codex of Ibn Mas'ud to support a legal argument. Mm. Well, this is even up to the Ottoman period. Uh, so it is an interesting case, Ibn Mas'ud, and I think, you know, it deserves um, more careful, you know, study. Unfortunately, we don't have manuscripts from that period, but uh, it is very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's turn to uh, to Water now. You mentioned sort of a, a paradox, and I think if you walk us through this paradox, it will help us understand a little bit more of a nuanced view about the importance of Tawatar and how it developed. You describe the uh, Mutawatara, uh, yeah. consonantal skeleton of the Quran, and then accessing that through arguably non Tawatar readings. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that means? I think that'll help us understand this concept of Tawatar. Right. So that's one of the, the questions, big big questions that I ask in my in my first book. Um, the, this paradox is that the um, you know the Quran is transmitted uh, via Tawatur. You know this kind of self evident truth. Okay, it's known for every single Muslim. It's known for everyone. It's you know you know down to the detail. 
uh, it is as self-evident as the sun rises in the east and sunsets, you know, and sets in the west, right? So that's the uh, that's what Tawatu means. However, um, and that's the Quran, okay? So that's between the two covers. Now the paradox is reading it, you know, it's it's uh, pr the pronunciation or performing this text. Um, because we do have different systems of readings, we have different ways of reading it. Um, how did, you know, these eponymous readings uh, or system readings, how were they transmitted? Were they also transmitted by a Tawadr? And, you know, the answer is also problematic because it seems that in the early period, they were not thinking this concept of Tawatur was not applicable to, to Qira'at, okay? Uh, it was basically a local thing, you know? It was, this is the reading of the community, let's say, of Kufa or the community of Medina. Later on, uh, what we call the Usulis, the, the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh, uh, principles of jurisprudence, they came up with this principle of Tawatur. And then they would say that the Quran is mutawatir and also the readings, its readings are mutawatir. However, uh, other scholars also, they oppose this notion because they, the criteria of tawatir doesn't apply to these. When you have a reading which has a single chain of transmission transmitted only by few people, even if it's transmitted by three or four or five transmissions, this does not provide um, tawatir. And this is why, um, let's say in, in um, you know, in, I don't say early period, but let's say fifth century, sixth century, that would be 11th century, 12th century. There were scholars who were calling for this criteria of Tawatur because you do, you do want the Quran to be Mutawatur. If the Quran is not Mutawatur, that's a big problem. You, you know, it is the main source. Um, it is the principal book of Islam. And if you say, well, it doesn't provide or it doesn't uh, impart necessary knowledge, uh, then it is a problem. So you have to establish the authenticity of the text. And if the variant readings, the way you access this text are not mutawatira, then you do have a very a theological problem. Um, and that's the paradox here. And this is why scholars were back and forth, um, you know, even by the time of Ibn al-Jazari, he, he died 833, so that would be, you know, 15th century. Um, you know, and as I mentioned in my book, in the early period, his, in his early life, he was fighting for this concept of Tawatir. He said, well, all the Qira'at uh, are Mutawatira. Uh, but then, you know, later on, he, he did change his mind and he didn't stipulate Tawatir for that. He said, as long as we have a, a sound chain of transmission, that's enough. Because also in, in Islamic, uh, you know, theology or Islamic jurisprudence, if you have a sound chain of transmission, then this you know, it's not necessary knowledge, but, you know, it, it is, you know, you have to act upon that. Okay, so as long as we establish sound chain transmission, that's enough for us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the paradox, which, you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, but, you know, especially in the past, I would say 200 years, there isn't a single book of introduction to Quranic sciences, except that they say, well, the variant readings are transmitted by a Tawatur. They picked up that word and every single, there isn't a single textbook of introduction to Quranic sciences in the modern period that they say, well, the variant readings are transmitted through Tawatur. However, you know, where's the footnote? We go to the sources and we see that that's not the case. Um, or at least, you know, it's not so obvious. And this is why I try to tackle this question and see, you know, where this notion of Tawatur comes and can you really prove, um, you know, the, uh, the Tawatur of Qira'at at every single stage back to the Prophet. So you could prove Tawatur, you know, let's say right now, of course, all the Qira'at are Mutawatira now. Everyone knows that they are documented, they are over the internet, but was this the case 500 years ago or 600 years ago? And when we see things change over time, we start asking questions. Well, you know, the way we have the Qira'at now are different from the way people were reciting, not big differences there are small differences but they are different nonetheless interesting so you've given us an excellent summary of the five stages we talked about the importance of the variant readings we talked a little bit about shawad and tawatur um i'd just like to get a couple of details um of each one of these stages and we'll skip number two for now because i want to finish there yeah. so let's just start with 
stage one, uh, the first canonization with Uthman. So I want to give a complete um, non-specialist perspective. We have Uthman, he's the caliph. He has the authority to make these decisions. Right. His instructions are comprehensive, um, yet he's very specific down to the dialect. Yes. Um, he orders the destruction of non-conforming codices. So it's not immediately clear how variants arise in the first place. So can you explain how these, these variants first arose? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 again, we unfortunately, we don't have, uh, you know, much documentation from that period to give, you know, a, um, you, know an, you know, an answer or an opinion based on facts. But, uh, you know, based on these few accounts of why Osman did, why Osman did this. And at, actually at every single stage of what I'm calling canonization, the reason why you want to standardize is because you have differences. You don't just come and then you want to standardize something if it's already standardized, right? So what was obvious back then, also from the accounts that we have, is that people or the companions of the prophet, they were reciting in different ways. And um, uh, some of these readings survived in the sources, others did not. Um, so what Othman wanted to do is that, uh, you know, you want to render the text in, you want to gather all Muslims based on one text. You know, you can't afford to have different versions of the Quran available uh, among the Muslim community. Uh, especially, I mean, the, the account the, that of the collection, the main account, it's, it's also put the, uh, the variations of the Quran vis-a-vis -vis the variations uh, in the books of Christians and Jews, you know that's very obvious. So when when Hudayfa ibn Yaman comes to Uthman and tell him and told him, well, you know, you have to uh, save, you know, the book of the Muslims so that they will not differ in the way that the Jews and the Christians differed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the whole, you know, they were I don't want to say obsessed, but you know, this was always a, something that you know Muslims were thinking about that we need to have a standard version. We can't afford having variations. And that's why, you know, the first, um, uh, you know, canonization or codification is to try to get rid of variations and gather all Muslims, you know, on one codex, um, which succeeded in eliminating variations from what we call the codices of the companions. But then you would have the second problem, which is uh, how do you pronounce or how do you render, you know, the, the stack? Uh, so that that would be the first, you know, it's it's, you know, the, the reason why I didn't start with that period is that I want to get a sense of what's happening, or what happened in the second stage, third stage, fourth stage, and you know, my plans is to go back to the first stage after I finish all these four, um, because things repeat themselves in a sense. So if if I get a clear idea of how things were standardized you know, in those periods, probably we can get a clear idea of what happened in the first period. Now, again, you know, we, you know, we, we, can, we can have a seminar on just, you know, the first, uh, the account of Othman, and it's very, there are many problematic issues about, you know, the collection, especially the committee that he put, you know. So besides Zaid bin Thabit, who was, you know, known among the companions to be erudite, knowledgeable about different languages, especially Hebrew and Syriac, you know, the other three members in the committee were not, did not fare as well. So the other three members in the committee, the three of them, they were nine to 10 years old when the prophet died. So they were not really senior companions of him. Um, and three of them, they were, they married, they were husbands for three of Othman's daughters. You know, so again, you see how politics here is, you know, very intertwined with, uh, you know, with the decision of who Othman chose in the committee to um, to standardize the text. So again, you know, politics is very important. You know, people shouldn't uh, dismiss uh, politics and the decision of the state uh, to standardize a text. This happened with Othman. This happened with Ibn Mujahid. He was the uh, chief, you know, uh, reader uh, in Baghdad, and people who opposed him like Ibn Shanabud and Ibn Muqsam, um, they were tried, tortured, persecuted, according to sources, imprisoned. Um, so, um, uh, so that's, you know, that's always something in my mind that we, when you look at things were standardized, we always look out about, we always look at how state 
enforce this kind of standardization uh, on, on the community. And it takes time. It's not something that, you know, you wake up one day and then all everyone is reading the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave uh, stage one, can you give us an idea of how developed the script was that Uthman would have used? So, yeah, so it's, you know, as as people know, the, the Arabic, the Quran was the first book written, right, in Arabic. So uh, this is why it's called, you know, the book. Um, or even later, Sibawai's book was called the book. Um, but we, uh, the Arabic script was not developed, um, you know, it, it was derived from uh, Nabataean, um, as Semitic philologists um, uh, researched and determined. Um, we didn't have vowels, we didn't have diacritics. Uh, now, was this the reason why we have variant readings? Because we didn't have vowels and diacritics? Not necessarily. Um, yes, there are certain ambiguous passages uh, in the Quran that you do need vowels and diacritics, and this is why readers disagreed however the agreement you know the percentage of of verses that the readers agreed even though they were you know from different uh, cities um is high you know so you don't have someone who's completely reading something that is um uh, completely opposite of someone else so the syntax um is basically the same the disagreement are on those uh, in these cases where you don't know if you should use passive or active, uh, you don't know who the subject is, you don't know how to conjugate, you know, the verb, uh, the prefix. Um, so if you are familiar with the language, I mean, even until today, when I'm, when I write something very quickly in Arabic, I don't put dots. And you know, we even have manuscripts in Arabic, you know, uh, even up, even, you know, six, 700 years after dots and diacritics were developed where you don't have diacritics. Mm -hmm. So so diacritics and vowels are not the main reason. They are one of the reasons. They are one of the reasons. There are very, very obvious cases where because you don't have diacritics and vowels, there were variant readings. It's very obvious. It has nothing to do with dialects, has nothing to do with, um, you know, plurality. It has nothing to do with uh, different modes. It has to do with the script. Um, but the majority of variant readings were not because of lack of diacritics and vowels. Mm. Um, if you know the language, if this is your language, you can read, you know, you can, if I give you sentences now in English and remove all the E and I and A from them, you would be able to read it with no problem. Excellent. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right around stage one or the first canonization, uh, many viewers may be aware of the uh, traditions that Omar Hamdan collected about al -Hajjaj. Do you believe that al had any major part to play in this canonization process? Uh, well, we do have accounts, right? And also Muslim scholars are divided. So, you know, a group a group would say that al hajjaj did introduce reformation of the script. And other scholars say, no, he didn't, right? And I do believe, I, I'm, I'm inclined to say that actually he did include, you know, certain, you know, uh, reformation in the text. Um, because if the early accounts and the early um, uh, scholars in the Qira'at tradition, they do transmit such accounts, I don't have any reason to doubt them, okay? So usually, of course, we have contradictory accounts in Islamic tradition, everything. There isn't, there isn't a single thing that we don't have contradictory, contradictory uh, tr traditions about. Um, but if you have an, an event, um, and even if you want to make it up, you make up an event, but if you have different people transmitting something about that event, it means that there's something true to it, right? And, you know, all the reformation that Al-Hajjaj did, you know, they were listed, right, by, by early sources. And, you know, some of them say they were seven, they were eight, they were 12, you know, etc. Mm -hmm. The point is, even if it wasn't Al-Hajjaj, you know, let's say it wasn't him, this person specifically, we do know that there were certain reformations in the early manuscripts, because if you if you see how people if if you see how people were describing certain readings, you know, in the second century, that is eighth century, and how the readers were reading hundred years later or hundred fifty years later, you would see that they were discussing you know these kind of specific variations, because there were spelling reforms that they were that changed over time. Um, so whether Al Hajjaj the person did that or not, or whether 
you know, a peop, you know, certain group in the community, they agreed to do this kind, you know, this kind of reform. Uh, I don't have any reason to dismiss these accounts as completely false, just because I don't want someone to, you know, to claim that he changed the script, you know, of, of the, uh, of the codices. Yeah. Okay. Throughout the eighth century, you've mentioned the influence of the grammarians and mm -hmm. I envision this as being more of an eclectic approach. And I was wondering if that's, if that's correct, um, where they are looking not so much at a, an entire reading to see if um, it's acceptable or not, but they're looking more at the microscopic level, at the level of words and uh, sentences. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? It, it is correct. Uh, you know, the variant readings of the Quran, it's the domain of grammarians. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where you, that's where it is being discussed. Uh, theologians don't deal with variant readings. For theologians, all variant readings are okay. If you want to know why we have this variant, not this variant, what is the justification, grammatical justification of this variant? You go to a grammarian. So this is where all the discipline of variant readings, it evolved from the early grammarians, you know, who were, who were trying to, you know, decipher the text of the Quran uh, based on the proper norms of Arabic and based on the proper norms of Arabic as um, that agrees with the corpus of pre-Islamic poetry. So you have the language of pre-Islamic poetry and the language of the Quran, they are very similar, okay? Uh, in terms of syntax, vocabulary, etc. So the grammarians, you know, people like al farra let's say, or Zajaj, you know, Sibaweh even, you know, their books, the, the grammar is all filled with Quranic readings. And this is the early source before Ibn Mujahid. And even if someone like a Tabari, who's an exegete, he's always quoting grammarians. Mm. So grammarians are authority number one when it comes to variant readings. And this is why grammarians clashed with, or not the grammarian, grammarians didn't clash with anyone. The uh, Muslim scholars later on clashed with grammarians because grammarians would be criticizing some variant readings. I would say, well, this, this reading is not grammatical. This reading is not good. And later uh, Muslim scholars who wanted to say, well, all the readings were correct. They say, oh, you grammarians, we don't listen to you. You know, so if a reading doesn't match, you know, Arabic grammar, you have to make it match Arabic grammar or conform to Arabic grammar, or there's something wrong with your Arabic grammar. God doesn't speak bad Arabic, right? Okay. So, uh, so, but again, the discipline of variant readings and justifying variant readings, it's, it all mainly resides in grammatical works uh, and exeg exegetical works, which are grammatical in nature. Um, yeah. This uh, grammatical and uh, theological contrast, it seems like, is what got Al Tabari in trouble because he's using the Razm, he's using grammar, um, he's using consensus, mm -hmm. and he's selecting what he thinks are the good readings. But then later on, when the readings are canonized, mm -hmm. it seems like they're read back into pre Tabari time, mm -hmm. and now he looks like he's rejecting readings that are canonical. But it's not his fault. It seems like he kind of got dealt a, a bad hand uh, with history there. Well, I mean, exactly. In, in a sense that, you know, this is this is why it's important, you know, for for us when we are trying to study, you know, a certain phenomena that we don't apply our own standards today and say, well, this is how Muslims thought about X 500 or 600 years ago. So for Tabari, the whole notion of every single reading transmitted by, you know, Ibn Amr, the Damascene should be correct. It, it never existed. You know, for him, he had these readings and then he would basically judge, is this better than this reading? And the whole argument that I made, if a Tabari or even early scholars, they thought that all these readings were divine revelation, you wouldn't be saying, you know, this, this one is better than this one if both of them are God's word, right? Which is different from how later Muslim scholars dealt with this. So later um, uh, scholarship on the justification of variant readings, they justified every single variant reading based on some kind of Arabic grammar, because for them, every single reading should be grammatical. And this is why someone like a Tabari or people or Zamakhshari or even Ibn Atiyah, you know, those exegetes, you know, they were saying, well, wait a second, this reading is really not grammatical. This is bad Arabic. Uh, this is, Arabs would never say something like that. 
And that's why, you know, this kind of criticism for Tabari later on um, is that, oh, you know, he, he wasn't a, a reader of the Quran. Um, you know, we don't agree with his criticisms. Okay, fine. You don't agree with the criticisms, but it doesn't, uh, he also doesn't agree with your, you know, also evaluation or criticism. So that's yeah. why um, uh, going back to, to early sources and reading, you know, these documents, it gives us, you know, a, a good map of what people thought at different periods of time and not to apply, you know, certain notions that um, people believe in now, uh, but they were not existent, existent you know, um, centuries before. Yeah. Uh, or they existed in other forms. Um, yeah. Excellent. Let's go to stage three now. Uh, this is the two Rawi canon. Of course, you produced a detailed article on this in 2013. I was wondering if you could just give us kind of the broad strokes. You've already mentioned uh, Aldani is one of the um, major influences here. Could you just describe uh, the scholars who were behind this, why they uh, limited the readers, and um, also kind of the geographical side of it too, because that's interesting to see. As you said, um, some of this stuff is is geographical as well. So could you kind of uh, summarize stage three for us? Sure. <clears throat> so post the, Ibn Mujahid in his book, uh, we do have, as I said, you know, those seven eponymous readers, and each reader has different transmitters. Okay. Yes, he did rely on transmitters on certain transmitters more than others. But you would find, you know, one reader, let's say, you know, Kufa, Asim, you know, you would have probably 15 or 16 different transmitters, okay? I mean, you can imagine how difficult it is for any, uh, you know, student or even scholar to be able to memorize uh, all the different variant readings transmitted by one person if there are even disagreements from that same person. And what happened is that uh, you need manuals, you need textbooks for students, okay? You can't just teach uh, introduction to variant readings and then give, you know, people five volume book on the different variant readings, right? You need a manual. And what happened is that Danny, uh, he was, you know, he died mid fifth century, mid, mid 11th century. Um, he has several books on Qiraat, on, on variant readings. And the biggest of them, it's four volumes. It's called Jam al Bayan. Okay. And he doesn't limit himself to two per reader. Like he, he transmits every single variant reading, which is supposed to be standard, right? For him. He's not saying the standard are only two. Um, <clears throat> but this is a four volume book, very complicated, that you only need to be, um, you know, not just initiated in the discipline. You really need to be a scholar of, of Qiraat and grammar to be able to understand it. So he wrote this manual called the Taysir, which is, you know, 80, 90 pages in some editions. And he said, I'm going to limit myself, you know, to two transmitters per reader so that it would be easier for people to memorize these variants. And of course, people need digests. They need, you know, shorter manuals. And it became very successful. And it was, it started to be taught at different schools. And what made it more popular is that 100 years after Dani, a shatabi became and then he versified this manual into a poem. He versified it, and poetry is, is you know, it's uh, very important in the Arabic tradition. You memorize things through didactic poems. So he put the whole manual into, uh, into a poem. <clears throat> and since then, it became the, what we call shatabiyah, is, you know, how people memorize the variant readings through these texts, shatabiyah and Dani's taisir. And, what happened is that, you know, this is how you get access to the variant readings through, you know, these two texts and through the two transmitters from one person. But in actuality, there are more transmitters, you know, that we do find in these uh, manuals of Qiraat. But people started from that period onward, they were only relying on these two transmitters. And this is why it is an important phase three, because now we started to only focus on two renditions per reader rather than see all the different renditions that we received from one eponymous reader. Hmm. So, and if you open, if you if you go through uh, Dani's Jami al-Bayan, the four volume book, you would not find only Hafs and Shu'ba, Abu Bakr Shu'ba. You would find many, many, many different transmitters like Ibn Mujahid. But it's very difficult, you know, for anyone, unless you are an expert in the field, to memorize every single thing. And that's how, uh, you know, this, third stage 
it became important because the tradition from that period onward, they started to rely more on this notion of two per reader, mostly in the Western part of the Muslim world. In the Eastern part, they were still resistant to the whole notion of the seven. And this is when I compared, you know, the manuals of, of readings from the Eastern, you know, parts of the Islamic world. And they were still doing eight readings, nine readings, six readings, and they were, you know, relying on different transmitters. But what happened is that this book, Shatabiya, the poem, it became popular. People, even in the East, started to memorize it, and it started to, to be taught in schools. And this is where, you know, people were now familiar with Hafs, Asim, Shoba Asim, Warsh Nafa, and then all the other transmitters started to be forgotten over time, except for the elite, you know, um, educated uh, readers whose profession is, you know, just doing, uh, you know, Qiraat or readings of the Quran. Yeah. So is it correct to say that this was never, uh, let's say, legislated uh, like uh, Ibn Jahid's standardization? It, it became popular and became dominant? Is that correct? correct? It okay. wasn't, it wasn't, you know, they, I mean, the thing is Danny, both Danny and the Shatibi, they did enjoy patronage from, uh, you know, from the courts. So Shatibi was, uh, you know, recruited to Egypt and he was given a house and then he was given, you know, uh, funding money, just like teach. Um, and um, Danny was also recruited to one of the courts um, uh, in Dania. Um, and he, uh, you know, wrote these books. So both of them, they were, you know, the um, uh, highest, let's say, uh, authority in Qiraat. Uh, what made Shatibi's uh, canonization popular is his poem at the end. Okay. So uh, if it were not for the poem and for uh, Danny's uh, Taysir, you know, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, this kind of two rawis per system unless someone else would have written, you know, another manual, you know, limiting it to two. And since Shatabi, after Shatabi, this tradition of writing didactic poems on Qiraat, it became very popular. Mm -hmm. And that's why also Ibn al-Jazari, uh, the addition of his three reader, the readings also became popular because he also wrote a poem on that. So people mm -hmm. also now memorize the poem on the three additional readings um, because it's easier to memorize. So they memorize, you know, Shatabiya, you know, the seven readings plus the three, if you are doing it, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the 10, the 10 standard readings. And because he wrote this poem and people memorized it, it also became easier to memorize. Mm -hmm. So uh, despite, despite the fact that before him, there were many attempts to, um, uh, uh, to write, to uh, not canonize, but, you know, to write manuals on, you know, 10 readings, nine readings, eight readings, but, you know, he was politically influential uh, and, you know, his didactic poem, and he was an authority in the field, and he wrote a didactic poem emulating um, Shatabi, you know, 300, 400 years before him. Excellent. So this process of the two Rawi canons started in the West, it spread to the East. Is it safe to say that it became stable by the 11th or 12th century or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it became stable by the, you know, right after Shatabi, it just became popular even, you know, during his time, his lifetime. Um, and Shatabi was, you know, described in, 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 you know, even in the sources, you know, due to, to his success, you know, and, you know, he would see dreams, he would see the prophet, uh, you know, he was, you know, almost elevated to, you know, a saintly rank, you know, in, in the way that he was described in, in the sources. Uh, so definitely by the 12th century, you know, this kind, this system in schools, in schools uh, where people, you know, uh, were memorizing, um, uh, I mean, even until today, people, if you want to memorize, if you want to get certified in varied readings, you do it through Shatabiya, you do it through Shatabi's poem and through a poem. Um, okay. But yes, so possibly 11, 12th century, we would say 12th century, we start to see in bibliographical information, you know, indices that people have commentaries on this poem and there are many many copies in different uh, libraries uh, where people are interested in copying and memorizing it and studying it. Excellent. Uh, so let's stop by Ibn al-Jazri before we go back to stage two. You described he wrote a poem on his three additional readings. Mm -hmm. uh, for many of us it seems far too late for him to canonize three additional readings. Does his ability to canonize three additional readings, it, does that reflect a continued sense of 
um, uh, dislike by Muslim scholars in having seven kiraat, which of course cor could have corresponded to the seven ahruf. Were, were Muslim scholars just wanting to get rid of the seven in effect? Uh, definitely, because even after after Ibn Mujahid, there was a lot of discussion and criticisms against Ibn Mujahid. Why did you choose seven? Why did you create, you know, what we call this shubha, this, you know, creating this doubt in, in Muslims that seven, the seven ahruf that, you know, the Prophet uh, mentioned in his hadith are the seven readings. Uh, but so that's one reason. Uh, you know, we don't want to, well, we don't want people to think that the readings are the Ahruf because mm -hmm. as I said multiple times, no one knows what the Ahruf is. And if someone tells you that he or she knows what the Ahruf is, well, no one knows. So we take the word of Muslim scholars who spent years and years and years trying to understand what the Ahruf are and no one knows. Uh, there are speculations, but at the end of the day, they're only speculations. So one, we don't want to match the seven uh, readings with the seven ahruf. Second, still there was a lot of resistance to limiting uh, qiraat. You know, Muslim scholars, especially exegetes, you know, you don't want to limit yourself to a canon. And if we go to uh, 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 books of commentaries, Quranic commentaries, you know, commentators are always going far and beyond to try to understand a certain verse or give, a, you know, a commentary on a certain verse. And they would use every single variant reading possible or available to them in order to give you a different aspect or a different interpretation of the verse. So people dislike the fact that you are limiting them to a canon. Mm -hmm. You know, they want flexibility. So, uh, you know, scholars of Qira'at were always criticizing the community. Why are you limiting us to seven? Why are you limiting us to two per one, i.e. 14 uh, transmissions? And it's very ob obvious in, in many statements by Muslim scholars, why are people only thinking that the Qur'an is only Shatibiyya? Why people are thinking the Qur'an is only Taysir? We have more readings, we have more variations. We should cherish that and not limit it. Okay, so Ibn al Jazari comes from that perspective, and then he said, "Well, you know, people should stop thinking that the seven readings are the only Quran or the only Qiraat, you know, to decipher the Quran or to read it." And then he um, added those three readings, which were already, you know, it's not he was not the first time to transmit those readings. They have been, you know, in circulation since you know the 10th century. Uh, but what, what he did is that he was able to really, you know, create this kind of system where the 10 readings with his poem uh, and, you know, he was able to, you know, as I said uh, several times, you know, he was able to talk with the, with the jurists during his time, um, convince them to, to declare the 10 readings, not only the seven, the 10 readings to be mutawatira, you know, as divine revelation. And uh, he was successful. And after him, again, you know, in the Islamic world, in different schools, uh, they memorize Shatibi's poem and Ibn al-Jazari's poem, uh, you know, when they, are when they want to get certified, you know, in the variant readings. Excellent, excellent. So this takes us to our final stage, which I think is um, probably the most interesting, and that's uh, Ibn Mujahid. And what I want to do here is just leave the question very open-ended. Um, he made, he's a giant at, in this uh, period of history. Uh, he obviously made some very important decisions and had the authority to do so. So could mm -hmm. you just tell us about him and then um, wherever you want to go with this, uh, if you could give us a foreshadowing of uh, your book that's coming out next month. And as you do that, I will keep an eye on the comments. Uh, Shadi has agreed to answer some questions. So any questions that come up that are related to this topic, as he's telling us about Ibn Mujahid, I'll put those up on the screen. Sure. So, so yes. Yeah, so the topic of my uh, of my forthcoming book, it's um, you know Ibn Mujahid and the founding of the seven readings. Uh, so it's a um, you know um, continuation of uh, the first monograph, and of course why he's important because uh, he's the first one, or at least you know we have this is the first manual we receive. Uh, which was which became the prototype, let's say, of all manuals of variant readings afterwards. And the way that you know he starts with the principles of recitation, and then he discusses the individual variant readings of the Quran. Um, why he's you know again important because um, uh, before him we only have 
uh, bibliographical information about manuals of readings, but we didn't receive them. So that's this is why his book is very important. Um, why I'm, of course, interested in this, because as I said, I'm studying all these different stages. I want to see uh, what did Muslims, you know, in the ninth century uh, recite? Uh, were they reciting, you know, the same um, uh, readings that we are reciting today? Uh, were there readings back then uh, that they people were reciting, and then we stopped reciting them now? That's that's the very important question here for me. What you know, the rise of shawad or irregular readings, and you know, I argued, and I'm now more convinced after I you know did a thorough study of his book that the concept of shawad, you know, it's not only deviating from the Osmanic codex, but it's violating the consensus you know as long as there's a, some kind of consensus uh, whether it's you know local consensus or general consensus uh, then your reading will be relegated into you know this you know shawad realm uh, so we find many readings in ibn mujahid uh, that uh, people stopped reciting today and even stopped reciting 300 years you know after him um, he also disagrees you know i think seven or eight nah, times with the canonical readings them, themselves, with some readings, for, let's say, from Ibn Amr or Hamza, he would say, this is wrong, something that you don't find later on. Uh, he also has a lot of, uh, <clears throat> I think I counted 64 transmission errors in his book, where he said that there's this transmission is wrong, this is wrong, it should be this way, it should be that way. So he is, you know, he was more critical in the way that he was compiling his book, mm -hmm. uh, different from how later uh, authors of, of Tira'at where they were just documenting, they were receiving and then writing down without really um, uh, trying to sift, let's say, through the material. Um, so that's why he's, you know, he's important, and you know, he is uh, one of the important what we call tariq or path to the Meccan reading. So without Ibn Mujahid, you don't have access to the Meccan reading. Let's say so Meccan reading, you know, Ibn Kathir, he has, you know, two students, uh, Qumbul and Al-Bazzi. So through Qumbul, he has also two paths, Ibn Mujahid and his colleague Ibn Shanabud. Both of them, they were, you know, the channels through which we know the reading, the Meccan reading. So he's also important, you know, as part of this, you know, living uh, chain of transmission. So uh, that's the, you know, topic of the of the book. Um, I studied, you know, the all the all the variant readings in his book are documented. There will be a uh, a complete uh, you know chart at the end of the book with audio material so and everything is transliter transliterated so people who don't read arabic can read the transliteration and can also hear the audio with the specific uh, you know so you don't have to hear the whole verse you just listen to the word i did that you know all myself in the past four years so um hopefully we will see how it goes uh, hopefully next uh, next month it should be it should be out yeah yes Yes, excellent. Uh, so a couple of questions. One is uh, kind of a question related to modern Muslim scholarship. Is there, and and this is it's kind of related to the question, is there um, a consensus on the number of readings today? If, if you took a survey across Muslim scholars, would they all say 10? Um, would there be a, a variant? You have three groups. You have one group that will tell you seven. They have the other group that would tell you 10. And you have a uh, smaller group that would tell you 14. We do have actually now, there's uh, Sheikh Hassan, Hassan Sakandari. You know, if people want to look him up. He's uh, an Egyptian uh, reader, uh, official, not just, you know, an amateur. And uh, he is he is certified and he teaches 14 readings, not just mm -hmm. that. So there are people who think, you know, seven, 10, and 14. Um, so the system of the 14, you know, has been around for the past 200, 300 years. People were, you know, trying to add four readings, you know. Um, uh, I don't want to say the majority of, you know, Muslim scholars would say uh, uh, the, those four are cons considered irregular. Uh, but let's say a majority, so less than the majority. A majority would say it's only 10. Um, another majority would say seven. And we do have a sizable um group that they would still use the 14 today in recitation excellent uh this is a good question uh some uh colleagues uh, van putin and uh al jalad mm -hmm. um what do you think in general of their work and how does that interface with your area of expertise uh i mean semitic philology and 
and code ecology is you know uh, you know the other face let's say of uh, of you know of our work so mostly my work uh, is concerned with arabic dialects you know post standardization in a sense um and uh, um you know i don't use uh, code ecology or you know i use manuscripts for books or when something i want to look something up but i'm not a code ecologist so this is where you know Jalad, as a semantic philologist, you know he and and Van Putin also he works with semantic philology and codicology. You know they are you know they study the status of you know Arabic vis-à-vis um, -vis other dialects. You know they you know he can tell you what kind of dialect was you know um, um, popular in the Hijaz. You know uh, we have you know this whole notion of the old Hijazi dialect, which probably the prophet you know was was speaking. Um, so this is very important in terms of how Arabic, or what we call Al Arabiya, you know, the standard Arabic, how it evolved, and this, you know, line of semantic philology is very important, you know, for for us to see what was happening, and then does it agree or disagree with, you know, the literature of Tiraat and different dialects, and to what extent dialects, um, you know, uh, influenced, let's say, the development of the discipline of variant readings. Mm. And, and Dr. Al-Jalad is producing a lot of data, isn't he? <laughs> it of must course. be difficult to keep up with. It, it is difficult, of course, but I mean, that's what, you know, the, the Semitic philologists, you know, that's, mm. they work with inscriptions, they work with all these different languages, and it's it's very vital for us to, uh, uh, you know, to, um, to consult this material, and, you know, especially when it comes to what we call the rasm, you know, why do we have certain words in the Quran written with wow? You know, it comes from Nabatinian slash Aramaic, you know. Uh, so it's important to 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 know why uh, certain uh, words were written as such, how certain words are are uh, are pronounced. So definitely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll end with two more questions, and these are easy. I can answer them. Uh, can someone please put the link to his book? And so, yes, I will. As soon as this live stream is over, I'll add that. But I also want to say in the description box, there are a number of links. So you can go to watch Dr. Nasser's uh, lecture on Vimeo. There's also a lecture on YouTube. And there's also a link there to the Bottled Petrichor podcast that Shadi appeared on uh, some time ago. And then the next question is, uh, what is Shadi Nasser's latest book? And that is the second canonization of the Quran, Ibn Mujahid, and the founding of the seven readings. And that's coming out next month. And I will add those links to the description box. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Dr. Nasser, it's been an absolute it's been a very quick hour. It's been a, thr a thrill to talk to you, though. I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you for spending part of your Saturday with us. No, thank you for having me. And um, I'm very glad uh, we had this discussion. So hopefully it was uh, informative and, you know, and helpful. And it's, uh, it was a pleasure to be here. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.